a very gracious evening to you, my fellow brothers and sisters. We are so happy that you've chosen to join us in this online a platform. Very, very gracious evening to this evening to continue our study series on the on the sanctuary. I invite you to just reflect on the day and to give thanks to the Lord, our God. As David would have done in Psalm 100, and Psalm 100 verses 4 and 5, he says, Enter into his gates and into his courts with praise, this virtual church, and give thanks to him and to praise his holy name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I'm sure that you are able to testify that the Lord is good and his love endures forever. And I pray that as we delve into the word of God this evening, as we understand his priestly role that he's playing in the heavenly sanctuary, that we will truly be able to identify and to say that God is indeed good and he is love. So once again, I extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. I invite you to bow your heads as we pray so that the Lord's presence can be with us. Our gracious and loving Father in heaven, we thank you for being a God of love, a God who cares, a God who is altogether wonderful, a God despite how large and Great you are, cares about us mere, simple, mortal human beings. We come asking for cleansing and healing of our sin-sick souls. We come asking for a greater revelation of who you are, for your Holy Spirit to come and to fill our hearts we are asking the Lord that you would teach us this evening through your woman servant so that the message that she would share, the Bible study that she would go through would be so clear, would impress upon our hearts to be able to truly say what a wonderful Savior is Jesus our Lord. Lord, we do not want to remain how we are but it is our desire to be changed, to become more and more like Jesus. Start this process of cleansing, start this process of transformation within us. And I pray to God that you would give us a yearning desire to know Jesus and him crucified. Take charge of everything that we will do this evening. And let it be that all the glory and honor will be to your name. This is my prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a song that we would like to invite you to sing along with us. You can put yourself on mute and sing this song along with us. It is, He Hideth My Soul. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus our Lord.
is fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O glory to God for such a Redeemer as mine. Amen. He hides us and he covers and he covers us there with his hands. Our study continues this evening, and Sister Marion has been truly allowing the Lord to lead and guide her through these studies. And we are praying that the Lord will do the same this evening. As she explores the topic, Christ in the sanctuary, his priesthood. So I'd like to invite Sister Marian to begin our presentation. And let's all see a special prayer in our hearts so that the Lord will guide and lead her. Amen. Thank you very much. Yes, we are continuing our study the sanctuary in heaven and the heart, Christ in the sanctuary. Last time we found that Christ built a sanctuary. He is the builder of the temple with, made without hands. And he himself is the sanctuary. And he himself is the priest who is in the sanctuary providing for us. Let's just have another look at the illustration we used last time. There we see the sanctuary and the left arrow pointing upward is the path that Christ took in the atonement as it is shown in Exodus. In Exodus, we have uh, several records of the sanctuary, the building, the the instructions, the building, and the furnishing. And it all starts with the most holy place and ends with the uh, brazen altar in the court. And that's an illustration how Christ came from heaven. He was God and he became man, covered his divinity with a veil. He lived a perfect life until he was an adult. And then he entered upon his um, public ministry at his baptism. And finally, he came to Gethsemane and the cross. And that perfect life, that perfect um, sacrificial death is all for us. And we know that he resurrected on the Right is the arrow pointing downwards, and that's the path of the believer who accepts the atonement that Jesus made at the cross through the ministry of the priest, as is shown in Leviticus. In Leviticus, we have all the sacrifices, and every time we read that the priest makes the atonement, the priest gives the forgiveness of sin. And the priest is the one that completes the work on, on the Day of Atonement. But it's continually the priest who intercedes and who ministers to the sinner. God is holy and righteous. 
and his holiness and his righteousness is unapproachable for us sinners. We are separated from God from uh, with a great gulf there that could not be um, crossed in any way except through the sanctuary, through the blood and the incense and the ministry of the priest, there was a way to approach God. And the sanctuary is an illustration of Christ and he is our only mediator. He is the sanctuary. Everything in the sanctuary points to him. And every ceremony in the sanctuary is an illustration of his ministry as our high priest. Everything in the sanctuary points to Christ. And only in him and through him can we be reconciled to God. That is the only way. And it's important for us to see Christ in the sanctuary. Let us just remember how he came from heaven to become man to make all this possible for us. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus was really God. He was God. He was equal with God. And he made himself of no reputation. He um, put away all his divine attributes and he took the form of a bondservant. He was a slave to his father. He was a bondservant to his father. He humbled himself. He became obedient. He became dependent. He became willing in his obedience to his father. And then we read that that obedience and that humbling himself came to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And that's the place where Jesus sacrificed himself for us. He was the true lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is where Jesus came to where we are. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. So here's the same. Jesus, who was God, became lower even than the angels. He became lower than Adam in his innocence before the fall because he came where he suffered death. The death for everyone. And verse 12 and 13 saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. Jesus came to where we are, not only to taste death for every one of us, but also to declare and to show God's character, to declare God's name to his fellow human beings. And he sang the praises of God. He spoke the praises of God. He displayed God's character and he put his trust in him and only in him and never in himself. Last time we studied that Jesus never trusted in himself, never did anything for himself. And when all our sins were laid on him in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
he experienced the separation between himself and the father. He had always been one with the father, even when he walked this earth. But then when the sins were put on him, he was separated. And we must realize that the suffering of the father was as great as the suffering of the son. And all of this was done to reconcile our sinful and rebellious hearts to him. The cross was the ultimate demonstration of God's character. And Jesus tasted death for everyone. Only he takes fully our place. And he is fully burdened with our sins. And he experiences our death, the second death, the complete separation of the father. And that's what he was willing to do for us. And he was willing to do it for us, but also to save us. Because we read further in the same chapter, Hebrews 2, verse 16 to 18. For verily, he took on, not on him, the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Jesus was tempted like us in all things, because he became like us in all things. And when all our sins and all our iniquities were laid on him, he was tempted just like we are. He felt what we feel. He overcame by his faith in God, even at that time, by the power of God. He overcame that separation, his faith won the victory. And that is the power, how the power of God came through him, only because of his trust and faith. I hope you remember that last week we, were, we read a part uh, from the Desire of Ages where it spoke about the cross and Sister White says that by faith, Jesus was the victory. He, the light and shone about him just a moment before he died. And he put down his life a victor. And we must understand that that was purely by faith and by trusting in his father. He was victorious. And now he's our high priest. And... Christ is a merciful high priest. It means that he's full of compassion and understanding towards us sinners. But he's also a faithful high priest. He's faithful to righteousness. And he cannot put aside the law. So he's faithful and merciful. The high priest must be considered of the sinner, but also of the one against whom sin has been committed. He has to bring the two together. And then after Jesus had risen from the grave, on the same day he, of the resurrection, he went up to the Father in heaven and he prayed this prayer. Well, that's part of the prayer that he prayed on that day. That was even before the sanctuary was uh, inaugurated and he was, um, he became a high priest. This is before that time. It was on the day of the resurrection and it says in John 17. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. 
is Jesus says, I am now a human being and I come to you as a human, but please give me the glory that I had before I became a human being, before the world was created. And he continues, I have manifested your name to the man whom you have given me out of the world. He says, I have shown your character to the world in all my life. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. He wants us, his brethren, to share in the glory of his being one with the Father. He wants to make sure that the great chasm, the great separation between God and the sinner has been overcome in him. And this is, of course, the meaning of the atonement. Let's read what Sister White says about this situation in heaven. He also had a request to prefer concerning his chosen ones upon earth. He wished to have the relation clearly defined that his redeemed should hereafter sustain to heaven and to his father. His church must be justified and accepted before he would accept heavenly honor. He declared it to be his will that where he was, there his church should be. If he was to have glory, his people must share it with him. They who suffer with him on earth must finally reign with him in his kingdom. In the most explicit manner, Christ pleaded for his church, identifying his interest with theirs and advocating with love and constancy stronger than death their rights, their titles, gained through him. God's answer to this appeal goes forth in the proclamation, let all the angels of God worship him. Every angelic commander obeys the royal mandate, and worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain, and that lives again, a tri triumphant com conqueror, echoes and re-echoes through all heaven. The innumerable company of angels prostrate themselves before the Redeemer. The request of Christ is granted. The church is justified through him, its representative and head. This is so important that we know that the life and sacrifice of Jesus enabled him to plead with the Father this way. And now Jesus is not only a human being in heaven on the throne with the Father, one with the Father, he is our representative and head. We are justified through him and in him, we are one with the Father. Nothing was withheld. God gave everything to us in Christ. In Jesus, he cleansed our sins. He crucified and buried our sins. In Jesus, he made us perfect. And in Jesus, he made us one with himself. In Jesus, he has exalted our human nature to his right hand and glorified it with a glory that was Christ's before the world was. We must fully realize that this all is accomplished. This has been done. And so we must realize that now 
Ephesians 1 verse 3 is completely fulfilled. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So nothing is withheld. Everything is given to us in Christ. Christ is the sanctuary built without hands, and in him is every spiritual blessing. We do not receive spiritual blessings from him, separate from him. No, we receive them in him. His incarnation, his atonement, and his priestly ministry mean everything to us. There's no other way we can receive any blessings. And that is why Psalm 77, verse 11 to 15 says, I will remember the works of the Lord, the works of the Lord, what he has done. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have, with your arm, redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Yes, we may consider ourselves a redeemed people. And all the works are done by the Lord. And our way is in the sanctuary. It is in Christ. Jesus is our faithful and merciful high priest. And he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary to cleanse his people from all sins. To restore them to their perfection of character. And that promise is a certainty. It's, we read here in Hebrews 6, and God compares the promise to the promise that was given to Abraham that he should have a son. Let us read it. Hebrews 6 from verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no, no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So, God didn't only say to Abraham, You will have a son. And you will have, I will multiply you. There will be uh, many, many children coming after you. But God swore. And when God swears, it's like it's double. He cannot lie. His word is dependable. But when he swears, we call it a covenant. When God swears, it is a promise. And we call it a covenant. And the only thing we can do with a covenant that God makes with us is to trust it, to trust and rely on it. And that's what Abraham finally did too. After he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. He, the only way Isaac could be born was by Abraham trusting in the promise. And now the comparison is made to the promise we have, the promise through our high priest of this perfection. And it says, thus God determined, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. So. God gives a promise of the immutability of his counsel and confirms it by an oath. 
that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. I do not think that God could express more uh, strongly the reliability of what he promises us. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence within the veil, into that within the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Abraham is our example of trusting the promise. The promise was confirmed with an oath. All Abraham could do to obtain the promise was to fully rely on and trust and have faith in the one who promised. There was nothing he could do himself. He was old. His wife was old. There was no way they could conceive a child. So all they could do was trust the promise. And the hope that is set before us of perfection of character, of being one with God, is as great a promise or greater a promise than Abraham had. And we are just as incapable of achieving that by ourselves as Abraham was of conceiving of a child. It can only be obtained by following the high priest by faith within the veil into the sanctuary. And there this promise can be obtained. That's the message here in Hebrews 6. Let's read Great Controversy, page 489. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he began that work which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. So Jesus wants our salvation and he has gone to heaven to complete it. And then Sister White writes, we must by faith enter within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered. So we must enter into the sanctuary to receive every spiritual blessing. We continue in, in the book of Hebrews, because that's the book that describes the ministry of our high priest most fully. And we read in chapter 7, verse 20 to 22, and inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord had sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Well, Paul tells us twice in the book of Hebrews that God swears and that makes it absolutely certain. He does it once in chapter 3 and once in chapter 6 where we, we've just been reading. So an oath is extremely serious with God and becoming a priest by swearing an oath is really very unusual. In the earthly ministry, the priests never became a priest by swearing an oath. They were not ordained by an oath. The priests in the earthly ministry in ancient Israel, they became priests because they were born in the Levitical family and particularly in the priestly family descended from Aaron. And God swears that whatever it may cost 
he will hold fast to the oath he has sworn. Jesus has been made a priest through an oath, it says here, because Jesus was not born in a Levitical uh, family. He was born from Judah, from the royal line. But he still became a priest, even though he was not a descendant from Aaron. And he became it by an oath, just like Melchizedek. And God swears that whatever it may cost, he will hold fast to the oath he has sworn. And Je Jesus is a surety of a better covenant. Whatever it will cost God, the Father, and whatever it will cost Christ, they will fulfill the promise. The oath is our guarantee of perfect righteousness, eternal life, the new earth, and even a place with Christ on the throne of heaven. That is what his priestly ministry must accomplish, and he's a surety, and God has sworn that it will be accomplished. So it is plain unbelief if we do not trust in Jesus. The Bible gives us every reason to trust in him, to believe in him, and to know that he will accomplish what he has set out to do. It cannot be that Satan or sin is stronger than this. That couldn't be possible. Let's continue reading in Hebrews 7, verse 23 to 25. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So the earthly priests were always replaced by the new generation because they died. But Jesus has life everlasting. He is our representative and head. He is our high priest and he can continue his priesthood. He never has to hand it over to anybody else. And he can save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. He can save from every sin. He can save every willing sinner. Doesn't matter who it is and how far they have fallen. And he can make every willing sinner perfect forever. He's able to do that. Let us just look. He can wash away all sin. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be are like scar scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Jesus through his ministry as high priest, with his own blood, can wash away every and all sin. He can save all kinds of sinners. There is no sin in the world, that sinner in the world, that he cannot save. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, you, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous or drunkards, nor revilers or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. But 
you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So any kind of sin, God is able to save us from that sin and to save the sinner and bring that sinner out of the sin and justify him and sanctify him and cleanse him. There is no sin that we cannot be saved from. And he's able to make perfect forever. He can make us perfect forever, never to be defiled again. Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And in Daniel 9, we studied that before and we studied and we said that the high priest is able to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. That is the true purpose of God in the sanctuary and its services in all time, whether in type in the Old Testament or in the reality now. That is what Christ does for us through his ministry as our high priest. And if, our, if we think that the high priest cannot do it for us, then we must believe that sin and Satan are stronger than Christ, than everything he has provided for us. All the spiritual blessings that the Father has given us in Christ, they should be sufficient for every one of us to believe that Jesus is able to accomplish this in us. Let's read Christ Object Lessons, page 156 and 157. Every provision, every provision has been made for our infirmities. Every encouragement offered us to come to Christ. Christ offered up his broken body to purchase back God's heritage, to give man another trial. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And now, not as a mere petitioner does the captain of our salvation intercede for us, but as a conqueror claiming his victory. His offering is complete, and as our intercessor, he executes his self-appointed work, holding before God the censer containing his own spotless merits and the prayers confessions and thanksgiving of his people. Perfumed with the fragrance of his righteousness, these ascend to God as a sweet savor. The offering is wholly acceptable and pardon covers all transgression. He who through his own atonement provided for man an infinite fund of moral power an infinite fund of moral power is provided for us, will not fail to employ this power in our behalf. His every look and word invites our confidence. He will shape and mold our characters according to his own will. Let us trust, let us have confidence in the work of our high priest, his merits, his blood, his intercession. And that's what we need. We need such a high priest. Once again, Hebrews 7, 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. He is a holy priest of a holy character. He is harmless. He's not revengeful. He doesn't harm anyone. He doesn't even think evil of us. 
he only does good for others. He is undefiled. He is clean and pure, and not a single blemish or defilement is on him. And all this was maintained in a life that could have been defiled when he was on earth, but he didn't. He kept his trust. And now he wants to give that trust that he has to us because his trust is our trust. His faith is our faith. He's separate from sinners. Christ could have joined sinners, but he didn't. And he gives that to us in him. This is our spiritual blessing. He's raised high above the heavens. He's at the right hand of the Father, higher than anything God created. This is our high priest. He is representing us before the Father. And we receive every spiritual blessing in him. His life is our life. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. We love to uh, talk about this verse, but I think we should understand it. Seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne, throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is a high priest tempted like we are. He was tempted not to trust his father, but to trust his own divine power, his own righteous self. But if he did that, everything would be lost. And then he would not be a faithful high priest that overcame every temptation like we have to. We need to learn to trust in him. Not trust in ourselves, not trust in our own works, not trust in our own ideas, not trust in our own efforts, but only trust in him. And then we can come boldly to the throne of grace, because there is mercy and grace in time of need. Every moment in Christ is all the power to overcome. And this message of our high priest was given in our church in 1888. I hope you've heard about the message of 1888 when Sister White, together with brethren Wagner and Jones, gave a message to the priest, to the church. And this message was centered around Christ, our high priest, and his work exactly what we are studying right now. And this message was to prepare the church for the loud cry and for the pouring out of the letter rain and for the close of probation. We are at the same point. We are now coming to that same point. And I'm going to just read what Sister White writes about this message of 1888. And I would like us to really consider this message, to read it again and again, perhaps, to just let it sink in what it means for us now in 2023. You can find it in Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 to 93. And Sister White writes, The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. We've just been reading about the surety. Because Jesus is a high priest by oath, he is our surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ. 
which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. To receive the righteousness of Christ is to receive Christ. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. The uplifted savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the lamb slain sitting on the throne to dispense the priceless covenant blessings, the benefits he died to purchase for every soul who should believe in him. The efficacy of the blood of Christ was to be presented to the people with freshness and power that their faith may lay hold upon its merits. And as the high priest sprinkled the warm blood upon the mercy seat, while the fragrant cloud of incense ascended before God, so while we confess our sins and plead the efficacy of Christ's atoning blood, our prayers are to ascend to heaven, fragrant with the merits of our Savior's character. Notwithstanding our unworthiness, we are ever to bear in mind that there is one that can take away sin and save the sinner. Every sin acknowledged before God with a contrite heart, he will remove. This faith is the life of the church. As the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness by Moses, and all that had been bitten by the fiery serpents were bidden to look and live, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Unless he makes it his life's business to behold the uplifted Savior, and by faith to accept the merits which is it is his privilege to claim the sinner can no more be saved than Peter could walk upon the water unless he kept his eyes fixed steadily upon Jesus. Let us remember to keep our eyes steadily fixed on Jesus. Let not our eyes be diverted to look anywhere else. Let not our eyes be diverted to look to the Holy Spirit. Let us look to Jesus. Next time we will be speaking about the former and latter rain and, and the Holy Spirit, but I think this message is very clear. It is Jesus who is our sacrifice. Jesus is our righteousness. It is Jesus who is our high priest. And we should keep our eyes fixed on him. And it is Jesus as our high priest who will cleanse the sanctuary. Daniel 8, 14. And he said to me for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. No one else but the high priest does that. The cleansing of the sanctuary and the finishing of the mystery of God are identical concerning the time and also they are closely related so that they are identical in character and event. And the finishing of the mystery 
is, we can read about that in Revelation 10. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, and there sh that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. The work of cleansing the sanctuary is to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy. This is done in the cleansing of the true heavenly sanctuary only in the finishing of the transgression and making an end of sins and perfecting the believers in Jesus. That's the only way it can be finished. If it's finished in us, it is the finishing and the ending of the work of the gospel. And the work of the gospel is to take away all sin and bringing in everlasting righteousness. Christ fully formed within each believer. God manifested in each believer in Jesus. That is the purpose of the gospel. And it will be finished when the sanctuary is cleansed. And this is the purpose. Colossians says in chapter 1, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So Jesus built a sanctuary in his flesh. He made an atonement in his flesh. And now he ministers as our high priest to present us holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And only the priesthood of Jesus, his ministry, with his perfect righteousness and his blood can do it. And we live in the time right now that this work should be complete and be done. Jesus is in the most holy place. It is the day of atonement. The only thing between us and the finishing of the work is unbelief. But let us believe in him who is doing this and trust him in doing it so that he does it completely and forever. Jesus is our high priest and we should trust him. And then he will return to earth. Acts 3 verse 19 to 21 says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The time of the coming of the Lord and the restitution of all things is very near. And when Jesus comes, it will be to take his people unto himself, to present to himself his glorious church. But he will remain in heaven until the times of restoration, until his church is restored to its original purity, the way he created man in the Garden of Eden without any, any sin or whatever. 
and he will remain in heaven and he will remain as high priest until that work is accomplished. But the time is near. And of course, Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And in Colossians 1, 26 and 27, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. It is revealed to us what God's purpose is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the finishing of the mystery of God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We in him, in the sanctuary, and he in us, fully and completely. Before Jesus returns to this earth, we will be brought to that state of perfection, complete in the image of Jesus. Hebrews 8, now this is the main point. This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. In this time, every believer in Jesus should rely on the strength of this true faith in the high priest. We should trust in the merit of our high priest and his intercession for us. And now the invitation is for us. In 1888, there was an invitation, but it was rejected by the church. The invitation comes again, and it comes to us. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He who promised is our faithful high priest well able to accomplish what he promised. And he's the surety that he will do it. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. But the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. This is our invitation. And let us endure in this let it not be something that we forget that we leave behind we go to the next study and forget about this one let us think it over let us ask god to impress us with this confidence this faith to enter with jesus into his final work and finish 
the mystery of God. There's now time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Marion, for sharing this wonderful message with us this evening. Indeed, Jesus is our compassionate intercessor. He is our faithful high priest. And he looks upon us as finite men you know, who are subject to temptation. But Ellen White, I think, writing in Fundamentals of Christian and Education, she says that he is able to help each of us who are tempted. And what a wonderful savior you know, we have. So I'd like to invite if there is anyone who has a question, uh, feel free to unmute your mic and to you know, ask the question. So that's just Maria can be able to answer. Hello. Hello, Linda. Yeah. Hello, Mariam. Um, I have I have one um actually a question I didn't really understand. Um the order of Melchizedek. What must I really understand fully of that? Is it because uh, that it's a high priest? That's a very good question. I understand your question. Thank you. <laughs> um the order of Melchizedek has, it means like there was an order of the priesthood, a Levitical priesthood, and only the people that descended from the tribe of Levi and particularly the, the family of Aaron, they were the ones that could become priests. So that was uh, through inheritance. They inherited the position of priest. but. Melchizedek was not of the tribe of Levi, actually. Um, Melchizedek lived in the time of Abraham, and he was not a high priest because of his descendancy from the priesthood. He was a priest because God had made him a priest by swearing that he was a priest. And Jesus is compared to Melchizedek, and Paul teaches that even though Jesus did not uh, come from the tribe of Levi, he is still a high priest in the same way that Melchizedek was a high priest by an oath from God. So even though Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, he is still entitled to be a priest because he was a priest in the way Melchizedek was also a priest by an oath of God. Do you understand? Yes, no, I understand it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who has a, a question that he would like to ask? Okay, I think I, I take it that everything. Your shed is clear enough for us to, to, to understand. Um, I'd like to invite us now as we uh, prepare for our, our first session to look at these three prayer points that I would like us to invite us to pray for. Um, points are on the screen um, for that God will give us a faith to, to give us a faith to cling to Jesus as our high priest that we would learn to trust his word and to walk and live by faith and because we would do those to demonstrate then through our lives, you know, what the grace and love of Jesus truly means. So I'd like to invite three persons to pray. Um, feel free to unmute yourself as 
the Holy Spirit impresses upon your heart to pray for these three prayer points that are on the screen. I invite each of us to bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Bible, for the spirit of prophecy that is so much light given to us of your priesthood and your ministry in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Oh, Father, please anoint our eyes so that we may see and understand your great purpose and your great loving care for us. And that we may come with boldness and with trust and with faith to you that you will cleanse us from all sin, that you will cleanse us to the uttermost of all sin and bring your righteousness into our lives. Help us, Father, to see it, to trust it, and to experience it. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, may this message not fall to the earth, but may your word accomplish what it was meant to accomplish. May there be a true revival in our hearts by faith in our high priest. Please, Lord, lead us. Lead us further into the sanctuary, into you, our mediator, because we know that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Father, help us, each and every one of us, to look up, to look up to Jesus and to trust, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are praying. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your love and goodness that you made a perfect sacrifice for sinners like us in order to be saved. We want to pray that you help us to trust your word, to walk and to live by faith. Because, Lord, you who died for us, your love is greater than our sins and that your, perfect was perfect, your sacrifice was perfect. Dear Jesus, even as we continue leaning at your feet, we want to pray that may the Holy Spirit water the word and that it will bear fruits in our lives. And through the aid of the Holy Spirit and you living in us, we shall walk and live by faith. Heavenly Father, help us to meditate upon such truths that we are leaning and that your word, which is transforming, may transform our lives. And like Peter, we can walk by faith. Heavenly Father, we want to pray that you bless your maid servant that is sharing your word with us and you bless everyone that is taking time to come and learn. Encourage those that are not being with us Help them, Jesus, to be encouraged and motivated to be attending such wonderful, lesson, such a wonderful lesson. Heavenly Father, even as we close this meeting, we pray that for your presence to be with us and that you will take care of us for the remaining days of the week before the Sabbath and that as we shall come together to worship you, you shall be with us. May you bless our going out and coming back. And above all, help us, Jesus, even in these last days, to focus on you, who is the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, as I come before thy throne with all my brethren and sisters here in this room, Father, I ask thee first, forgive us our sins, cleanse us and help us to keep in the way we are, Father, for hearing your word daily is more and more enrichment and more and more 
for us to see how we ought to be at the end of times. Father, I hope we are not too late and that we don't have, we don't be discouraged along the road being that the time is really ripening and the world is getting so difficult to cope with. But Father, you strengthening us as we go along our way and give us the faith and the righteousness that we need so we can come become more and more like you. Father, help us to walk through the sanctuary as we now are learning how to walk bring the whole church father your church you know us father you know exactly who we are and what we we are and, and how we 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 try to cling on to what we know and how to be but sometimes it's difficult father and only you know it for each one of us so father i beg you forgive us for our sins again and strengthen our walk daily Help us to get more and more your identity. Keep the children in the church. Keep the, the elders who is doing their work. Help them to get revived and re-strengthened in a stronger way of helping your sheep to eat the meat that we're supposed to be eating. Oh, Lord, sometimes I wish I had known many of these things long before. But I can only ask thee by grace to keep me in faith and keep every one of us here in the room strong so we can meet at the end at the holy gate with Jesus Christ to enter in. Father, I thank you for Sister Pell for the way she has taught to give the word. It's so a perfect way and easy to understand. I thank you for her capability to help us to, to understand each word and understand the movements in the sanctuary. But before I did not understand it that well and I'm getting more and more knowledge. I thank you dear Lord. Thank all those who is doing their work and help everyone who is in the church, to keep in the church. Do not let us weave no more, Father. Strengthen us more and more and make us the, the servants we ought to be. You know our calling for the higher calling that we have. We have to make it to that end, Father, so we could be the jurors that you will have in your heaven to judge the angels at the end. Oh, Father, I need your help. I hope others in this room might cling on to you too, but be with us daily and strengthen us. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, brothers and sisters, for joining us this evening. Um, we invite you to join us next week, same place, same time, 7.30 p.m., where we'll look at the early and latter rain, uh, part one. May the Lord richly bless each and every one of you, and thank you again, Sister Marion, for sharing with us the lesson this evening. God bless. Amen. Amen. Goodbye. Goodbye. Amen. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Everyone, have a nice week, Friday. Give you rest.